Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be looking at Furbies, the popular robotic toy that simulated having your own pet that learned English, played with you, and eventually broke down and transformed into a nightmare that spoke while turned off. Fun for the whole family. While this one was tricky, for reasons I will explain later, it was a lot of fun to take a toy that simulated being alive and turn it into an actual living creature. Through speculative biology, that is, not for real. Before we start, I'd like to thank commenter Krabbert for suggesting this episode, and please remember to leave your own suggestions in the comments for creatures you would like to see in future episodes. Also, if you're enjoying this channel's videos, please consider supporting the channel on Ko-fi, link available in the video's description. And, as always, I will be giving some design and biology notes at the end, so please stay if that is something that interests you. Now, without further ado, let's get started. While many creatures in our world have been successfully domesticated, or at least tamed, by humanity, few have been so rapidly and recklessly molded as the Forbes. This name is colloquially applied to many species of owls belonging to the family Forbidae, originally from North America. These owls have adapted to living on the ground, having long abandoned the skies of their cousins. They are no longer capable of flight, as their wings are reduced to the point of uselessness, barely aiding them in maintaining balance as they walk. Instead of relying only on eyesight and hearing, as do all species of owl, Furbies have developed an incredible way of sensing their environment, an infrared pit located above its beak. This pit is similar to that of certain species of snakes and bats, a thin membrane full of heat receptors which help it detect prey. While eyesight is a powerful tool for an owl, it is at its best when used from high places, such as branches, from which the owl can swoop down on its prey. Forbes, being land predators, hunt by detecting heat instead. Rather than looking for moving prey, Forbes hunt in the underbrush, searching for the heat signatures of immobile prey hiding in the vegetation. Interestingly, Forbes can also use this infrared pit for a manner of limited communication. By sensing the heat signatures of other individuals, Forbes can better understand their mood and general health condition helping them decide whether it is wise to approach them. Forbes have also greatly developed their hearing, which helps them catch prey once it is on the move. The so-called horns of these owls have developed into fully ear-like mobile structures, which can move independently to help them find the source of any sound they hear. Furbies are also notable for their intelligence. These birds have developed a complex language that has different sounds and patterns of sounds assigned to specific things, actions and moods, aided by their incredibly wide vocal range. This vocal capacity is so developed that Furbies are capable of learning and incorporating to their language sounds heard from other creatures in their vicinity including other species of birds, calls of different types of mammals, and even insects. These sounds can be repeated with such precision that they can even fool the originary species. For example, Furbies that have learned to imitate the howls of wolves will at times be answered by actual wolves in their vicinity. While all Furbies are capable of imitating sounds, the actual process of learning is much easier when the birds are young. 
Young birds from the same family that have been raised in different environments may end up having completely different dialects, depending on which noises they become more familiar with. The most famous species of Forby is Geostrix polychroma, the common Forby, renowned for reasons beyond their control. Despite their feral, unpredictable nature, the cute appearance and notable intelligence of these Furbies, as well as their beautifully patterned and colorful feather covering, led to them being captured to be sold as pets during the late 50s. While sales were rather low at the time, selective breeding instantly took place in order to create new, striking breeds of Furby. By the late 80s, Several breeds of multicolored feathers and novel patterns had been bred, creating new interest in the Forbes as pets. It was not until the 90s, however, that Forbes experienced a boom in popularity, soon flooding the market. Despite the continued supply of these creatures, sales at the time were so high that even the biggest Forby kennels had trouble keeping up with demand. This led to the appearance of clandestine Forby meals that attempted to fulfill the demand for these pets, often resulting in severe inbreeding and the sale of unhealthy Forbies, forcing the creation of laws that attempted to curb the dangerous breeding techniques and sale of these animals. In the end, however, demand was so high that even these laws proved to be ineffective, as parents desperate for these novel pets would seek any means to get their hands on one. As chaotic as the breeding and buying of a Forby was, the acquisition of these pets was, for many households, only the beginning of their troubles. Once introduced to their new homes, many Forbies had a very hard time adjusting to their new schedules, routines and social groups as well as the strange environment of a human house. And it was not only the sight of the animals that had issues, as pet owners also had trouble adjusting. As Furbies were a relatively new type of pet, and a very energetic one, there was little information on how to properly train and care for them. Some opted to adopt larger groups of Forbies, which ended up being a somewhat correct idea, as Forbies, being social creatures, fared much better when living in groups of their own. That said, Furbies, whether solitary or not, ended up socializing, feeding and playing at times that were inconvenient for their owners, especially at night. Many Furbies would end up trying to bring attention to themselves by loudly talking or squeaking in the middle of the night, many times frightening their owners. While many Furby owners look back on them fondly, the reality is that Furby breeding was proving to be too problematic, and the Furby market crashed before the decade was over. While most Furbies led long, peaceful lives in their homes, Many unsold Forbes ended on the streets when the kennels closed down, freely reproducing in the wild. Nowadays, Forbes are a common sight in many cities, for the most part having regained the earthy colors of their wild counterparts as they adapted to life in urban centers. Despite many capture, adoption and neutering programs, it seems like Forbes are thriving in their new environment and won't go away anytime soon. But hey, at least rats are not that big of a problem anymore. And that's it for our speculative biology look into the Furbies. Admittedly, it was a little hard at times to work on this one since a lot of the characteristics of Forbes are supposed to simulate life, and when reimagining such toys as real creatures, all of those features are lost.
As in, Furbies turning their eyes or speaking is no longer relevant, because animals already do that anyway. However, I had one other thing to work with, and that was the Furbies popularity boom, which I could use to explore how pet sales of exotic animals can have disastrous results. And also, it was just hilarious to imagine the Furby boom as happening around living animals, ending with them becoming ingrained in the fauna of cities. Just picture someone freaking out because a Furby got inside their home, or someone trying to eat a sandwich in public and getting harassed by a bunch of wild Furbies. Hilarious! All in all, I'm pretty happy with how this episode turned out. I had a lot of fun writing it, and I hope you guys had fun watching it as well. Thank you all who have placed suggestions in the comments below. I've had a blast working on them, and I'm still working on many types of episodes and series to honor your suggestions and ideas. So remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.